Thank you. Thank you. Let's go ahead and thank Dr. Strayhorn one more time for that wonderful keynote. Thank you. I always like to start with applause in case some um, things go horribly downhill <laughs> during the conversation. <laughs> so I, I was really struck by um, your comments on belonging. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about some of the ways that faculty in particular um, maybe fail to create an environment that allows all of the students in the classroom to feel like they belong. All right, so um, you want me to talk about ways in which faculty fail? You know, I think there are a couple of, um, well, what I'll do for the balance of time so that we don't end up going too far um, downhill is I'll share a couple ways in which we fail and then I'll highlight a couple ways in which I think faculty succeed. You know, I, belonging matters. It matters uh, for society. It matters for all humans. And it matters for student success. It is, uh, you know, the book that I wrote in 2012, the subtitle is A Key to Educational Success for All Students. I actually think in the sort of recipe for student success, sense of belonging is a critical ingredient. It is one that I think lots of people overlook. And to be quite to your question, I think a lot of faculty don't think about because, you know, for years, it's, it's been misrepresented and dismissed as the slippery stuff, the soft skills, the stuff that student affairs is supposed to worry about. I don't care if they don't like it here. I don't care if they're not comfortable. My job is to teach them chemistry, or my job is to teach them, um, but, you know, I always pick on scientists and mathematicians, so let me say it's my job is to teach them art history. Um, history still. But um, I think that that's one way that faculty fail, is by missing, one, the role that sense of belonging plays in success, which is what most faculty care about. Second is that, um, you know, not just mere, merely dismissing, I think that we also um, miss what we can actually do, the critical role that we can play in shaping the extent to which a student finds a sense of belonging. Said directly and, and more personally, you know, I'm a professor because my doctoral advisor looked at me one day on my path to where I was going. I was going to go back to DC and work for a, a think tank. And my professor, my advisor, looked at me one day and said, you should be a professor. And I said, really? And he said, yeah, you'd be a good one. Power. You know, I, I, I know that I stopped and turned and took a strong pivot in my career the moment a professor told me I could be a professor. Um, the moment an instructor, a faculty member, can, looks at a student and says, you can do it. You might need to you know, work on it. You might need to study a little bit. You might need to see me after class. But you can, you can master this, absolutely. Um, that, that is huge for building sense of belonging for students. Um, you know, the other thing is, it's not just mere words. I think we sometimes miss the tools that we have as faculty members for building belonging. I was giving a talk at a school in the Northeast one time. They took me to dinner. Um, so these details are not essential for you. They're essential for me to get to the point of the story, right? So I'm at dinner in the Northeast, and I remember sitting beside this gentleman who's a faculty member who said, you know, the part about belonging in your talk today just struck me. He's a theater instructor, theater professor. He teaches a, a course called Women in Film. He's taught it for years. He said this semester, wasn't until he came to hear me speak that he thought about it, probably like 15 students in his class, 11 of them have to be black women. There's not a single movie that they're gonna watch that has a black woman as the lead actress. And what does that do for their sense of belonging? In the classroom, their, their ability to find themselves in the, in the curriculum, in the subject matter, not to mean, not to mention their own sense of efficacy and maybe career aspirations. So with tears in his eyes, he's like, I just realized, I don't even know if I, I don't even know a movie that has a black woman as a lead actress. So it was the moment where the professor realizes when it comes to curriculum revision for diversity and belonging, I may no longer be the expert. I may need help 
resources to figure out what then can I incorporate in the curriculum in order to be successful. But you know, working with him and working with his teaching and learning center, there's a number of other folks who did it. He ultimately changed the curriculum. I write about it in the second edition of the book. He changed the curriculum. And, and guess who he asked? The women in the class, the students themselves. Hey, by the way, I just realized you're not going to encounter this. It's important. So are there movies that we should be looking at and film that we should be critiquing? And before you know it, he got lots of ideas that he was able to look through and then embed in the class. That's really important. So I think um, dismissing the importance of belonging, one, missing the role that we can play, and then not looking for opportunities to diversify the curriculum, the videos that we show, the guest speakers that we bring in, the authors that we expose students to is another way in which faculty fail. Now, the guy in the Northeast is one way that I've seen it. Um, work pretty well. There's a woman who's at a school in Michigan, is the way I'll describe it, and she's a science professor who teaches really, really large classes. And she says, you know, I don't think students come in here trying to find a sense of belonging. Um, and I challenged her on that. I think students do want to feel like, you know, hey, when I raise my hand, someone sees me, um, when I, that the class doesn't rush ahead with the unit, and that, you know, um, I can get someone's attention. Before you know it, she talks about how she organizes the classroom leaving an empty space between every two rows. Why? Because that means that if someone raises their hand, she or one of her TAs can get to them, either on this side or that side. And the powerful, the ways in which that just changed, being able to help students, being able to get right to students in the time. Um, and then also, you know, in terms of water filtration, this is one of the units she teaches. She gives them an example she's used for years. What she has them do is, okay, so if I were going to illustrate it here, if you were my lab and I were going to make it more relevant for fostering belonging in this lab, I would say, all right, so in a moment you're going to get a test tube or something, um, petri dish, and I want you to go out and find some water. That's your assignment. And I would tell you, like, go every, wherever you want. Go to a place that matters to you. And meet us back here in 15, 20 minutes. And students would come, and then she would walk them through the three techniques for purifying water, fil filtering water. And then ultimately, they could run their experiments and write up their labs. But what they learned are things like, wow, this is water that was from the, my residence hall. This is water that's from this you know, um, YMCA where I volunteer in the evenings. This is from, and before you know it, there's a personal attachment to the learning experience in a way that fosters belonging. I think thinking of just like really small things like that is another way that faculty either fail or when they think of it can succeed. Excuse me, as an extension of that question, so something that you just spoke on was student affairs typically having that responsibility. I know for DePaul here, we have an amazing student affairs staff. I will all of you, but so many of these conversations are happening in student affairs, but unfortunately, it doesn't always transfer over to the classroom. So how can staff and faculty start, you know, working in tandem, essentially, mm -hmm. to ensure that students feel that in the classroom, but also um, at the school in general? Yeah. I think these do go together. Um, you know, hopefully the questions are coming in or, or will. Um, you know, I, when working with fac I've never met a faculty member who says, look, I don't care about my students. I don't care if they belong or don't belong. I don't care if they succeed or don't succeed. And I really don't care if they're successful in life. I'm sure those faculty might exist somewhere in the world, but I've never met them, and it's no need to rush to introduce me to them. Um, most faculty do care. They care about their students. They care about their success. They care deeply about their disciplines and their research and their writings and their, their scholarship and their subject matter. Um, and I think that, that is, those are the raw ingredients that we need in order to invite, draw, engage them in this space around diversity. Um, that is, how can we make diverse, as I try to do in the talk, although you, know, you have to scrunch these things together in limited time, how do you help them understand that um, 
you want to you want to maximize learning diversity is part of the equation you want to make learning relevant diversity is part of the equation you want students to be engaged and most research coming out of the center for post-secondary research at indiana university suggests that engaged learners perform better have lots of long-term positive outcomes so i think that's where you get faculty excited about research and thinking and theory that way and then what most faculty need are ideas then about like how do i do it um and you know without uh, you know the workshop later and things like it you don't really have opportunities where faculty get to do it I think student affairs you know um, most people get into student affairs because they love students they want to work with students and quite frankly in their graduate preparation they're exposed to courses around multiculturalism and diversity and um, human development in ways that equip them for talking to students in this way but when your PhD is in fill in the blank I'm not even gonna pick on a discipline um, it could be molecular biology but it could also be higher education statistics right um, so when your PhD your training is in that discipline you may or may not have had courses that have you thinking about how human development evolves over time um, what's on the hearts and minds of people right now you know if anyone's teaching a student right now who's between the ages of 17 and a half and about 23 the number one question on his her or her mind their minds whatever their preferred pronoun might be um, their the number one thing on their mind right now is the question who am I how do we know that because decades and decades and decades of research have shown in the human evolution that's the question that they're preoccupied with. So they might be in your classroom learning Spanish, but on their mind is who am I? And perhaps that is even their motivation for studying Spanish. It's may maybe that I'm studying Spanish because maybe, and part of who I am is I'm gonna be a world traveler. I'm gonna need to have another language. Maybe there's a part of my culture that connects to this language, my background. Who am I? Preoccupied with it. It shows up in chemistry classes. So I think then the instructor who is woke, the, the instructor who is conscious, is the one who says, OK, if that is my learner and that's what's on their mind, then how do I make questions about who am I, which are inextricably tied to then who are you? Because one way I answer who I am is by knowing who you are. OK, so if I know that you're tall, then I know that I'm short. If I know that you're good looking, and you are, then that means that I must be also good looking, so I'm not going to say I'm ugly, right? Um, we, we do this in contrast to one another. So quite often, instructors who really get it pay attention to, OK, in the classroom, you know, if I wanted to um, teach math, you know, I've worked with teachers in urban settings who use general knowledge of a local crime as the example to teach math skills, you know? How fast would you want to run if you had to get away from that scene in five seconds? If you wanted to get from here to the local corner store, how far is it? And it's so cool for students to start learning and like, I know that corner store, but this is what makes Google Maps so exciting for people. They're like, oh my God, that's my house, that's my car, right? Um, the distance and amount of time, before you know it, you're teaching the math concepts, but over an understanding, a context that is familiar and personal. And um, you can teach, and it's not just the government or the politics professor who should talk about the most recent election. I think all of us can grab a part of the election and bring it into the classroom in a way that people start thinking about issues of economy and policy and human difference and um, patriarchy and feminism and you know all of this played out for us in a way that made a marvelous case study for all of us to use in the classroom I think that's the way that and, and then finally so faculty can do that I think if you get them to think about it, they're like oh my gosh I, I just thought of something great but then the question is like okay then how do I execute it in the classroom? And to me, that's where the Center for Teaching and Learning, um, learning specialists are important to partner with. Even some of our colleagues in student affairs have really good strategies for doing so. I like to use case studies where um, you know, the example is either a video or it's something that I've borrowed from a book or it's something that I created being inspired by a written case study so that I don't have to say, hey, Michael, tell us about your what it was like for you growing up. All right, everybody, now we're gonna use this as a backdrop for discussing, and now Michael feels sing singled out, much like Professor Joe Reese did to me and two other black students when I was in school, right? Because those are with you for a lifetime. I only remember his name, because he did that to us 
the harm that was done, and it's a story that I talk about. That's the long-term impact of doing this badly. Happy to share more later. I love that you bring that up because that actually connects to, well, there's a competition for two most popular questions up here. Um, so I'm going to go for the one that seemed like a segue um, there that um, now it's down to three, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> that, you know, when we have conversations about race in the classroom, um, I think a lot of people are wondering what are some strategies for facilitating participation for students that may be reluctant to speak up. And one of the things that I have noticed in the classroom is that sometimes students are reluctant to speak up, perhaps because they are uncomfortable talking about race because they haven't had too much in their life. This is usually our white students coming from environments environments where that hasn't um, often been something they're asked to do. But I also noticed something that some of my students call racial fatigue. You know, the students of color are so often asked to be the ambassadors of the conversation, and they're tired. They want to learn other things. Yep. And so given that we have these multicultural classrooms, we're in an urban environment, you know, what strategies do you offer in terms of um, creating an environment that uh, bridges the conversation without exhausting students? Yep. So that's a very, huge. very important question. And it's huge. And I will not be able to answer it fully because there are probably 112,000 things that I tell people. But I think, I don't think, I know, five of them um, and seven strategies are on the handout. So if you don't have a handout, then make sure you get one that give you just a couple of things that I think um, are commonly thought about. But, you know, so those are the printed things, things like making sure that you um, acknowledge the importance of race or that you understand and interrogate the history, the things I talked about in the keynote. Um, but here's some really tactical things that work well for, one, engaging people who are silent, and then two, creating safe places where everyone who wants to participate can. Let's go first to the silence. And that is to understand that silence is an action, especially in conversations about race. I haven't done a survey on this, but my guess is if you had people um, identify and rank the ways in which they respond to conversations about race, folded arms and silence would be pretty high up there. It's actually, interestingly enough, maps onto research we know about how people respond to fear which only affirms what I said at the very beginning of my talk, and that is the reason why a lot of people don't engage in race, it looks like stubbornness. It looks like disinterest, but actually at its core, it's fear. Fear of being wrong, fear of making mistakes, fear of being labeled, whether that is labeled, oh my gosh, you racist, or oh my gosh, you mad, angry black woman. Whatever it is, it's fear of being, ra fear of being harmed, fear of being labeled. Um, all of that is really important for it. So it's, you know, we look at silence and say, oh my gosh, they're not participating. But in fact, with the way I look at it in my classrooms, especially when we start talking about issues of race, I look at someone and say, I'm like, oh good, they're participating. Because silence is participation. I have a shirt that says, if you remain silent about things that really matter, you are complicit in. I mean, it's a whole phrase. But you know, sometimes people are silent because um, they don't know what to say. And they need time for their thoughts and their sensibilities to catch up with each other. And I think another mistake that a lot of faculty make, especially faculty who are socially conscious and you know, the ones who really want to talk about issues of race, they say, why are you so silent? Come on, say something. And sometimes you've got to appreciate the fact that some people just need time, not just some people, most people. In fact, I wish more people would take time to just be with their thoughts for a moment before they let it out, right? It takes time to talk about issues of race. And so, and, and in a, you know, a controlled classroom environment where you have so much time, I get it, you want people to, but I mean, I've made mistakes in the past where I'm like, you like you want to say something, what is it? And I've called on or called out for a half-baked idea. So sometimes just giving people the space and the time and yourself space and time to, to be silent, be comfortable with silent, even in issues of race. Second is to understand that some people are silent because they're, it's not so much I don't want to participate, it's I don't want to be harmed. I don't want to speak up, 
And then for someone to say, are you serious? Did that really happen? I, did it go down that way? Are you being sensitive? Don't you have to have a tough skin? All these things that happen in educational spaces. The way I think faculty can be supportive there is one, um, you know, there are some people who will never speak up until they're called on. You get to know your students, you know who those students are who need you to create space for them to speak, and then you do it. Even for the person who always has their hand up, you stop calling on them and say, anyone else who has not spoken have something to say. Or if you know students well enough and you know that Michael always likes for you to call on him, you say, Michael, how are you, do you have something to say here? Anything you want to share yet? And you give him time. If he says no, keep on moving. I think that's what educators do is we become the facilitators, co-creating with our students this space where we can jump in and jump out in this deft game of like double dutch um, in the classroom, right? So this is one reason why people are silent. It's also because they need space. They need someone to, they want someone to create space for them to share their voices. And then third, reason why a lot of people don't participate is because, especially don't participate for certain faculty per se, is because that faculty member either has or is developing a reputation for being the person who allows anything to happen in, in those conversations. And I'm not saying that faculty have to police contributions. But in my syllabus, for my classes, I have a whole paragraph devoted to this issue. And it says things like, um, you know, in my classroom, it's really, really, we're building a community, co-creating a community where everyone feels a sense of belonging. Part of belonging is that you feel safe insecure, visible, cared about. To do that, we have to be civil. But in our quest to be civil and for everyone to feel secure, that does not mean we cannot be candid. I'm going to be candid. I want you to be candid. Um, we are going to always try to assume positive intent, but we will never deny negative impact. Now, let me tell you, if I can, for one anecdote. I say that, it, it flows so beautifully on syllabi. I mean, I love my syllabus. I'm like, oh, I love this paragraph, right? And so it worked well for years. Well, one year, I was teaching a diversity class. And I'm going to say it the way I need to say it to get the story out. And please understand that I do not say it this way anymore because of what I learned from the experience. I was teaching a diversity class. In my family growing up, if my grandmother, my grandmother, my mom sent me to the store to get a Slurpee. I lived across the street from a 7-Eleven. She would give me $2 and say, go get a Slurpee for me. And I would go across the street and get her a Slurpee. Let's say the Slurpee, Michael, cost $1.50. I would get my mom the Slurpee. And I was like, 50 cent? Oh my gosh, I'm rich. What should I do with the 50 cent? Give it back to her. Spend it. And I spend it on bubble gum or something. And then I go back home and I give my mom her Slurpee. And she would say, where's my change? And I said, it was $2. Or I'd say, you don't have any change. Maybe I wouldn't lie. I would say, you don't have any change. My mom would say, I know that Slurpees are $1.50 and I should have 50 cent change. Where's my 50 cent? And my mom would say, you gypped me. It meant I stole money from her. So I was teaching my class, I don't know, four or five years ago. This is even after writing about diversity, right? Talking about diversity, speaking about diversity. And in my class, I'm telling this story, and I say, gypped. And I watch as three students turn to each other quickly, and they're like. <laughs> and so I'm trying to tell my story, but I'm like, distracted. I'm like, what is going on over there? Right? And before you know it, you can feel the energy. Daggers. And now they're co-opting other people into this. Before you know it, half my classroom is polarized against me. I'm feeling it. I'm not even sure what went wrong. I've lost traction with the story. All I need is a good break. So I said, you know what? It's break time. You guys take a 15, 20, I don't know, five hour break, and I'll see you next year. Something like that, right? So I get up, and I go out of the classroom, and I'm like, what in the world just happened? And these three students come over to me and said, Dr. Strayhorn, we need to speak to you. We are outraged at what you just did. And I said, what did I just do? And they said, did you not hear what you just said? I said, I said a lot of things. They said, you said gypped. I said, oh, yeah, in the story. I said, you don't know what that means? So yeah. So like my mom used to say, it, like, I stole from you or something. They said, no, it has a history. It's referring to gypsies or people who were labeled as gypsies who come from that background, who are some people in this room, labeling them all, stereotyping them all as thieves and robbers. I didn't know that. I had never heard the history of the word. I had never thought about it that way. 
in all of my writing and all of my travels, no one ever told me that. My mom certainly never told me that. So I go back in the room, I apologize for what I did. Because although it was not my intent, I will not deny the impact. I asked for forgiveness. Listen, I asked for forgiveness. That doesn't mean that everyone forgave me. Most did, but I know for pretty sure that two of them have never. And that becomes a complicated classroom where you're teaching students who have not forgiven you. You're teaching students and grading students who you are indebted to and you're hoping that will forgive you for something that you did at this point months ago. You know, and it's still manifested from time to time. So what I'm talking about is complicated. It's not as simple as putting it in your syllabus and thinking just because it's there. And the other reason why that, that it connected to on that point is when I started talking to students, like, I just don't understand. I mean, I'm trying to recover from this mistake and so forth. And you know, they said, well, in your syllabus, you said you know, you're striving to build a civil classroom. So we're holding you accountable to the fact that that's uncivil. What you said was uncivil for some people. And in your quest to be civil and to be respectful, we're going to be candid. So my students felt comfortable being candid with me. You know, I, long story short, for faculty in the room who feel it, you know, I, that was one semester where I, I was like, can you quit teaching a class mid-semester? I mean, I, I asked my department, I was like, what if I just said, OK, A's for everybody. You don't have to meet anymore. It just doesn't happen. You've got to stick with it and stay with it. And you have to figure. And so I found myself trying to recover um, not only through apology, but being very careful in, in um, future classes. But here's what really got the, the most support for me after that incident came. When I came in the classroom, I admitted to students, I still feel it, still here. I understand that's, that's what I have to deal with. You know, I have to deal with that because that's what I did. I created it. It's the same as when um, I had a white colleague who once used the N-word in the classroom who you know, it took the whole semester to try to recover, to build, restore justice and order in that classroom. And he would say things like, it's frustrating. It's frustrating, but that is the responsibility. That's the consequence of this happening in the classroom. And what we had to do as educators is rise to meet that expectation. So what I did was one day in class, I said, you know what? There's a whole history. There are a lot of words that have history about which we know nothing. I don't want to do today's lecture. I just want to talk about words. What are those words? And before you know it, the experts in the room started sharing words to which other people were like, wait, that's one? Oh my gosh, I didn't even know that. I could have made a mistake. I used that word yesterday. Someone said, I'm so tired of people referring to African Americans as Oreos, that is, you're black on the outside and white on the inside. And then one of the Asian ones said, rock on, brother. I'm so sick of being a banana. And they said, a banana? <laughs> Yellow on the outside, white on the inside, to which one of the students said, yeah, but you know about apples. Apples? Red, Native American on the outside, white on the inside. Before you know it, go to your uh, computers, not now because we're talking, but later, Google racist stereotypes in food. There's a whole website devoted to hundreds of these and how we use them. What happened that day by doing that was students realized, wow, we could all make mistakes like he did. Every word has a history. And that's where I found the most forgiveness. Yeah. So thank you for whoever asked that question. Thank you. We have just a few minutes left, so let's go ahead and choose some of these questions, right? Michael, is there one calling to oh, you? Gosh, we can't see. OK, so I'm going to like make an escort off the stage real quick so I can actually see. Um, let's see. Oh, wow, OK. <laughs> Everybody wants this one. OK, the Trump era has ushered in a, a wave of overt displays of white supremacy, especially by young white men who feel entitled to a higher social position by virtue of their skin color. How can these um, young men be engaged in a way that is constructive and educational? And is that even possible? Yeah. That's a tough one. Um, so, Michael, you're supposed to skip to the easy questions. <laughs> I'll talk to you later about that. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, what does it say? The Trump error has ushered in. You know, I took a class in my doctoral program from a really wonderful instructor named Peter Wallenstein. He's a historian. And Peter was cool 
AKA weird in the classroom. He's funny, he's like one of those, he's like a real professor, you know, like one that just is so brilliant, but funny, dry humor, but just weaves in and out of this world and some other world, um, you know, all the time. And, and, and you hear what I said, a real professor, so my own perception about professors, right? Um, but I loved him, I loved his class. And I remember I wrote a, a paper for Peter where I said something like, Brown versus Board of Education ushered in. And I, and I remember Peter gave me a great grade on the, the paper, but he agonized over this word I used, ushered in. He problematized it. I've never seen that much feedback on a paper about one word in my entire life. And he said, historically, it is inaccurate. Brown versus Board of Education didn't create anything. What it did was it sort of legally sanctioned it, um, it but it did, the conditions were already unfolding. And, there, and he showed, as a marvelous, wonderful, bright historian, he showed me evidence of how this, you know, these um, precipitating events. And so, for whatever reason, reading that question um, gives me the opportunity to say that I don't think as much as the person who's in the White House does not reflect my own personal political po opinions, political perspective. I don't think that it's fair to say that Trump ushered this in. It's giving way too much power to a single individual, even a single administration. It also then um, limits the kind of success we could have in fixing it because we start thinking the problem is Trump and his administration and then once they were removed, there, now it's all fixed. And actually, um, as much as I adore President Obama, and you have a video over there, I adore you, I want you back, okay. Um, <laughs> This is like a real talk show, like it was live, live, American, live television, right? Um, as much as I adore President Obama, these conditions were present even when he was in the White House. What I think has happened and will continue to happen is that certain political um, opinions and decisions and the sway of government will affirm those feelings, these beliefs, in a way that they start to look like they're authorized. And it's when an individual feels like their behavior is authorized, they become more public about it. It's been happening, it's just, not, it wasn't author, it was, it was clear that this was not authorized kind of behavior. You can't go around doing these kinds of things, punching people in the face and driving over people's bodies and putting whites only signs. So um, burning down, can't, you can't do these kinds of things. That is unacceptable in society. It happened, but it was silent, closeted, clandestine hidden. I think what's happening in society now is it's this illusion that these are authorized, valid opinions and perspectives. And even educated young white men um, from really great schools get co-opted into that experience. So here's what I think. Can they be engaged absolutely. Now I have to tell you, this is just like my heart and my mind meeting in the moment and sharing with you. Um, I've met a couple people recently, the senior leader of a really large national education association who said to me, uh, he doesn't really agree with this. I believe in education. I think education, I know it's what I write, but beyond what I write, I think education is transformative. It, it, is tra it has transformative power. Um, how do I know this? Because I once had a grandfather who, can I just be transparent with you and, um, and vulnerable with you so that we can get where we have to go with this question? I had a grandfather who hated white people. He hated white people because he was a black man who was sent off to war, had an injury because of the world war, had locked himself into his home, had never gone outside. Literally, my entire life, my grandfather never went outside. At, the, at his house, he would sit by windows with the door closed and with the window closed. And all he remembers is what happened to him in the war and how it was white people who used him as a shield to protect themselves. And that's all he had. I love my grandfather, and you do too. He's deceased now. Um, but growing up, this is what I would hear about white people, AKA my classmates, 
AKA my teachers, AKA my best friend, Jason. And as I was going through education and learning things like what a stereotype is to things like we all want to feel safe and secure. We all want the best for our kids. Women um, struggle to earn the same wages in the workplace as uh, men. I would take it to my grandfather. And I would start telling him things like, you know all white people aren't like that. You know that all black people are not my friends. You know one of my very best supporters is my doctor advisor. He's a 70-year-old white male Texan who looks like Hulk Hogan but the wrinkled version. <laughs> And I know a black professor down the hall who doesn't even say hello to me. And I watched as my grandfather would, he could barely read, but he would pick up stuff and look at grass and he'd say, come here, explain this. And I would explain what it means and he'd say, mm-hmm. And I would watch as education interrupted his script for working through the world and before you know it, his love and trust of me exposed him through books and readings and videos and conversations to white people who are, um, who are conscious, white people who are allies, white people who want the world to be better. And before you know it, it disrupted these preset conditions or thoughts, and now he's in disequilibrium. That is, he was literally um, at this point of like, oh my gosh, what I used to believe is no longer true. Help me here. And before you know it, he turns on the television, hot dog, he goes to church one Sunday, gets up, leaves the house. And on the way to going to the church, my grandfather is going to preach his trial sermon this Sunday. And he stops to the grocery store to get mints. And the cashier is a white woman who says, how are you? You're looking so nice today, all dressed up. She sells him his mints. And she says, all right, God bless you. And my grandfather gets back in the car and he sobs his eyeballs out before his trial sermon. I'm sitting here looking at my grandfather like, what in the world's going on? And he said, there was a white woman in there and she was so nice to me. I guess it's right. He had now reached a new plateau. Cognitively, that's what learning's about. It's about exposure and engagement that disrupts what we currently think. We find it insufficient for making sense of the world. And now we're striving for more information. And then we arrive at this new place where all of a sudden things can be different. For me, I think that that, that example, the fact that my grandfather could become that way, means that these young men can also be engaged in this movement. How do we do it? I think we have to, first of all, we have to have conversations about race. We have to have conversations about oppression. We have to talk candidly and unapologetically about white privilege. The fact that some people are, you are privileged simply because of your race. And you know, we say things like, no, 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 not me. I'm still, I, I had a colleague one time say, no, not me. I struggled my whole life. Struggle and privilege are not the same thing. They're not polar opposites. You can struggle to get out of bed in the morning and still be privileged. Privilege is the fact that some people in this room could come up here and sit down and you are going to automatically be taken seriously. Automatically be assumed to be competent. And then there are others of us who get up here and as I was telling Sarah this morning, have to exhaust ourselves working to prove to people who don't even really know us that Erin knew what she was doing when she asked me to come speak. <coughs> so privilege. It's a privilege to be able to walk into a room and be seen as expert and teach us a lesson. And listen to this, and make mistakes, and him and haw and, and pause and stutter, and students still leave saying, oh my gosh, he's a genius. Versus writing an email with one typo and they say, oh my God, my professor's illiterate. English must not be their first language. Because that's what happens to people of color. That's what privilege is. We've got to talk about it unapologetically. Put it out there, let's just deal with it. What do you not believe? What, do you, what other evidence do you need? And I think if we can do that, get them on the privilege and oppression, understanding how the world works, then we can start to engage them in this idea that one, um, what's called this, this sort of mutual interest, it is in our mutual interest to get along. It is in our mutual interest to restore order out there. It benefits no one for us to go back to a segregated society 
it benefits, I'll snap for myself or clap for myself, it benefits no one to go back to that society. So, you know, um, I think writers like W.E.B. Du Bois and James Baldwin and them, they were far more eloquent than I on writing about the social benefit to us restoring the kind of order and justice we want to see in society. This idea that, you know, um, there's this, uh, everybody wants to belong, but everybody also wants respect. And listen, when they can't get it, they'll settle for fear. That's the politics of the 40s and the 50s and the days when I was not alive. What people really wanted was for people to respect them. But since they couldn't get people to respect them, they created a society where people feared them. And the rationale, the psychology behind a lot of this is this belief that one way I can get women and people of color and immigrants to give me what looks like respect is I'll make them afraid of me. I'll threaten with torches, I'll threaten with violence, I'll threaten, and it leads us nowhere. Um, fear is no alternate for respect. Respect is earned, it takes time, it takes work, it's harder. But I think if we can help students become conscious of what this is all about and the mutual benefits of us restoring justice and then use education and the power of education to transform. I believe education is transformative. It can change their mindsets into understanding this is not what I want to do. This is of no benefit to me. Going back to their and instilling fear that there are, there are um, civil ways of doing this. There are nonviolent ways of doing this. I think education has the power to do that. I don't know what the power of education is to change evil. I think there are evil people in the world. I don't know, I haven't thought deeply enough. Any psychologists or philosophers in the room, let's talk about that over lunch or something, but um, I've seen education change people who are racist into people who can sit beside people who are different from them and act um, professional and accordingly. I've seen education take white students at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, my first academic home, and prove to them, prove to them, show them, demonstrate to them that African Americans don't have tails, that all Asians are not um, good at math, that, and that's, not, that's, not a, that's a good thing, that we don't believe that. That's a stereotype about a group of people, um, that not all um, Latinos uh, speak Spanish fluently. These things that get the education, exposure, interaction got there. But to the extent that some of those folks are also um, evil and intend to do evil, wreak havoc in society, I'm not sure um, what strategies we can do. But I also believe that if we can be successful with those who are not that way, we can transform and change our campuses. Yeah. Well, that's such a wonderful note to end on, the possibility of transformation. I'd like to thank you again for this conversation. Um, thank Michael. Thank myself. Oh, also one thing, excuse me, one thing. It's actually each one specific person I'm out here. I want to say thank you to our EVP for um, academic affairs, Katie is here. Will you stand up real quick? She helped us out from the student perspective, and all the students are here because of the uh, work that she put in. So I just want to publicly say thank you.